Hi, everyone. I'm Maria Thomas. Ken Stern introduced me just before lunch. I'll just briefly say it's great to be here. Um, I am moderating this panel on innovation as it relates to HealthSpan. And as we heard this morning, HealthSpan was defined um, quite broadly by many of the different uh, speakers and panelists who were on this stage. And I think we're going to hear different perspectives now as well from the panelists uh, that I have with me. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves, um, but I'm just going to tell you briefly, uh, we have a great geographic representation here. Uh, Michelle Norris here uh, joins us from Columbus, Ohio. She's an executive at the nonprofit National Church Residences, and she'll tell you more about that. She's been a long time executive there and has played pretty much every role I think there is uh, in the organization. Gina Beck joins us from San Diego where she is a senior business development manager for Amazon's Alexa Smart Properties um, as it relates to senior living. And she actually has a uh, long experience prior to joining Amazon working in that senior living arena. So she'll tell you more about that. And next to me is Pooja Aika, who is a founder and CEO of a new company called Eternal Health, which is based in Boston. She has taken on the very admirable and monumental task of starting a new Medicare Advantage plan in Massachusetts. So um, with that said, I'm gonna ask Michelle to start us, each one of them to please introduce yourselves a little bit more thoroughly than I have. And also, would you share with the group one example that's not from your own organization that relates to innovation in the health span? Great. Uh, well, thank you all for letting me join you. It's lovely to come out here to California, um, though I will have to say OH first. Anybody know Ohio? I O. Okay. So sorry. That's just something we Go do. Buckeyes. We're kind of odd here in Ohio. Um, Anyway, so uh, yes, my name is Michelle Norris. I have been with National Church Residences for about um, 29 years. Actually, next week will be my 29th anniversary. Um, we've grown from a, a fairly small organization. When I joined, it was about 100 communities um, focusing on seniors. And we now have um, about 350 properties across the country. We serve the continuum of care, truly around our older adults from affordable housing, uh, assisted living, continuing care, retirement communities, home care, hospice, adult day, et cetera. So essentially wherever the entry point is, we really try to ensure that we can find a place or a way to serve our older adults. Um, so I don't have a very, I, I'm gonna stray a little bit, sorry. So I'm flunking this test already. Um, <laughs> So I'll stray a little bit and say there's not one particular thing, but it's the movement that I'm excited about. The movement that was actually just mentioned on our last panel with Dr. Shaw was about two things that are happening at the same time. <clears throat> one is health. Oh, there you are. Hi, thank you. Um, <laughs> is healthcare going into a just a different business model, truly from fee for service into a fully capitated kind of approach, which just changes how everybody thinks. And then the second thing is technology. We're an organization that very practically understands we don't have enough workforce to care for the growing number of elders. We just don't. And we see it every single day. So technology for us um, that is being embraced by both the healthcare and truly by real estate people like our organization is the way that I think we're gonna ensure a really good quality of life. Hi, I'm Gina Beck, and I have been in the aging and tech space for the last 13 years. Um, I started with a startup um, that actually supported a social platform, um, and then I worked with a large provider named Brookdale, or Emeritus Senior Living at the time, um, leading the resin technology inside of 60,000 residents at the time, and um, recently got recruited by Amazon during the pandemic. And just a little bit from an Amazon perspective, um, one of our big leadership principles is about customer obsession. And so the reason why they recruited me was that they were seeing that the older adult population, particularly in senior housing, was adopting Alexa more than they'd ever seen. And so they felt the need to bring someone from that space to basically build the business um, for older adults inside of the provider space. Um, in regards to innovations, um, I you know I 
I thought about this when Maria brought this up to me. And I think one of the things that I gravitate toward, one of the books that kind of rock my world and still is a North Star is um, Malcolm Godwell's Tipping Point. Mm -hmm. um, and how that if you can change the environment or do one thing that can actually accelerate some sort of transformation in, in whether it's so societal or in person's lives. Um, and that's kind of what I think in my life I've seen from an innovation perspective. Um, something happened in 2009. Um, there was a woman named Renee Glover from the Atlanta Housing Authority, and she decided to invest in all of her affordable housing building. She had 12 of them, and they all support older adults. And she said, I'm going to put Wi-Fi in every single one of those buildings. And I'm going to put a computer lab, a computer cafe. I'm also going to give tech ambassadors to train them how to deploy. And I do find it really significant. And I sit here next to my colleague, Michelle, that we have the affordable, um, the broadband initiative that's going across the country right now, that the same opportunity sits right now Especially, and I know I'm not trying to steal the thunder here, Maria, but knowing that there's 22 million older adults that are not connected to the internet, we have a unique opportunity to really take innovation and drive it for those who are, have no access in equity. Amen. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Pooja Aika. I'm the founder and CEO of Eternal Health. We're a local, I guess not local here, but we are a Medicare Advantage plan based in Massachusetts. We currently serve three counties in Massachusetts, and we are looking to expand into the Texas and Arizona markets. Um, what I think sets us apart in what we do is our focus on technology. And I know that's probably like a drum that's been beaten one too many times, maybe in the Medicare Advantage space. But um, I think for us, it's about not reinventing the wheel, right? Using existing technology that works, that's proven to work and finding a way to reduce our admin costs and our internal costs as an organization, because I think the first thing we need to do is look inward. Um, and so our goal is to be able to allocate seven to 8% of our premium dollars towards our admin costs. And the rest of it, we wanna be able to put back into our products, into our um, benefits so that year after year, we're creating really sustainable and affordable products where we're bringing down the cost to the premiums and the out-of-pocket costs while simultaneously making sure that we have really rich and robust benefits that we're offering. Um, and also I think, you know, Michelle, you brought it up, um, Value-based care is, is really critical and key. Um, I think starting to see that shift from fee-for-service over to whether it's full risk models or capitation models is gonna be really important. And that's something that we've fully embraced. Um, and a lot of those additional cost savings we see within our organization, we start to push towards provider incentives to make sure that the providers incentives and providers goals are aligned with the plan's goals because ultimately when we're aligned we'll be able to deliver better service to the patients and our members um, and really drive quality outcomes because I think at the end of the day that's really all of our goals um, in this room collectively. Um, to answer your question, mm -hmm. I don't know if I have a specific company. If I had to pick one, I would say probably um, Papa, one of the vendors we're working with. Um, and the reason I bring them up is because I think when we were talking and brainstorming earlier, we had all kind of identified a need for more social interaction in this day and age, especially after COVID and how that isolation leads to depression, which leads to so many other chronic conditions and other conditions to develop. And so something as simple and easy as just connecting someone to someone within their community that already exists, I think is so important and so critical in building that bond and relationship. Um, and once you're in the home, I think we all know here that for so long, people used to say, you know, at home care is more expensive. And I think we've seen time and time again, that's not the case. And so being able to shift over to more of an at home care model, but also getting that insight into someone's home. So being able to understand what fall risks may be present within their home, if there's other social determinants of health, but such as food scarcity or whatever um, they're facing. And then again, taking that data um, and taking that information and making sure we pass it along to all of the important stakeholders. So for example, 
within the plan, you want to make sure your care managers know that this person might have um, a food insecurity issue. And at the same time, when you're notifying the care manager, you want to make sure that you're also notifying the provider to ensure that the provider knows that there's a food insecurity issue. Um, and also the member, because to the member, you want to point them to, hey, by the way, we have a food benefit that you can leverage to maybe address the food insecurity you're facing or the financial burden you're mm -hmm. facing and kind of aligning and tethering all those dots together. And I don't think that just one organization yeah. can probably do it together, but it's all of us kind of coming together. Thank you. Thank you, Pooja. That's mm -hmm. um, very helpful. Michelle, one of the things that struck me when we were um, talking earlier to plan for this session was a phrase that you used, which is longevity is a privilege. Um, so I wonder if I could ask you to talk a little bit more about why you said that, sure. and also maybe just give us a little lay of the land around affordable housing, what some of the uh, numbers are, and what some of the opportunities and challenges are. Sure. Um, well, let me start with the affordable, so that mm -hmm. might be helpful. So I, I will not bore you with all the technical technical definitions because you could put together a wordle um, very easily about all the different ways we describe it, whether it's Section 8, multifamily, um, Section 42, LI, HTC, any of those would work. Um, but in the end, essentially, it really means that you must, you can't make too much to live in a building. Um, and that's how you, so you qualify to live in a building. And once you get there, there are two things that you could get in return. One, you could get a rent subsidy. Essentially, they will say whatever 30% of your income, you then, that's all you're going to pay. So if the rent in here, like I've heard the average rent, my Uber driver said he was paying $3,000 a month for, which makes me in Ohio gulp, um, <laughs> but $3,000 a month for a market rate apartment, two bedroom apartment. Is that, does that sound right? See, that doesn't see nobody. You guys just going to go. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so anyway, so if his, if his income was a thousand dollars, he would actually pay 300 instead of 3000. And then somebody writes the check for the difference, usually the government. Um, the other option is that you could have a below market rate rent. And so that's a different program. So essentially, one way or the other, you have to qualify to move in. And in return, you either get a very, very discounted um, rent or you get a, a below market rent. So that's kind of how all those programs work. They all work on pretty much the same philosophy as one of those two. There is a third thing, which is where it's specifically for seniors uh, or older adults. And those are also, you can either have a 55 year and above, or you can have a 62 year and above. So these are all the weird things that are, have to do with affordable housing that you never want to know. Um, what you do want to know is how important it is, right? We know that, and everybody in the healthcare system, I think, believes anymore, and they see the value of the fact that if you do not have safe, decent, um, affordable housing, then you're already six steps behind in terms of how good you can take care of your health. It is the first cornerstone of the social determinants of health. And I love the fact that I really feel like as we are moving into a more at-risk model, um, we are becoming really good friends with all of the healthcare plans because they want to access the affordable housing units that we own. And we see a great partnership really brewing because it's much more strategic between both sides. That being said, the other thing that we all know is that there's just not enough. Mm -hmm. um, the, at, the number is um, like 7 million that are just e even in just the extreme low income that are really needed. And if you think about seniors, they're going to be even more um, in need than because they have a much more unique setting that they need. So it's it's a really big issue across the country. There is no major city in this country that doesn't have an affordable housing shortage. No major city in this country. I mean, some are worse than others. Clearly the coasts are by far the more acute, but even in lovely Ohio, we have a major shortage of affordable housing. So um, did I answer your question? Yes, <laughs> yes, thank you. And speaking of questions, please um, be thinking of your questions. We will take some. Um, but first I wanna to turn to Gina. Uh, I have a question for the group here in person. How many of you have an Amazon Echo device or Alexa device at home? A good number of you, great. 
So you're some, some, uh, somewhat familiar with that technology. Um, Gina, I wonder if you could tell the group what, what exactly is uh, the smart properties idea coming from Amazon? And maybe then more specifically within older adult communities, what are some of the applications of this technology and how are you thinking about it? Yeah, so I do wanna to speak to the fact that there is a large majority of you own Alexa or some sort of Amazon type voice device. Um, one of the things that we've looked at studies recently, and again, Alexa is only eight years old and she is actually um, interesting enough, um, this voice user interface is what we see as kind of the new platform that people are looking at. And I think there was like a Google search, um, not, and again, just word search period is something like, um, it was 300 billion last year. I think it was like 2020. And um, the voice searches was 200 billion. And that was in 2020. So we're seeing that the voice searches are actually matching up with the word searches. And interesting enough, a population that started to grow during the pandemic, there were two actually. Um, we got huge outcries from both healthcare systems and by um, older adults. And the reason why is, as you probably know, your voice is a real easy way of engaging technology, especially a population that may not feel very comfortable. Um, in general, if you actually start to study a little bit about how older adults receive and use technology, um, is that as we age, our hands actually dry. Um, and because they dry, and I see, <laughs> she's like, yes, yes, this is, yes. And when you touch it, if you notice some of you, as, as well as myself, it doesn't work as well as you'd like it to work. And so that's actually a problem with touch experiences. Whereas with voice, it doesn't matter how old you are, whatever age, and you're talking about longevity and the whole century, any age can access that as with a simple voice command. And so as you start to see that with the Alexa Smart Properties, what we've done is because of this Again, customer obsession, the older adult population said, hey, we want to use this. And then the providers raised their hand and say, hey, we like to use this simply so that we can engage older adults inside their apartments, particularly in lockdown environments. When you can't communicate and you can't go into their apartments, could we use something like this? And by the way, Amazon, could you fleet manage it so that we can now, as an operator, be able to manage hundreds of devices Hospitals, the same thing, but their use case was slightly different. Their use case was, could we actually drop in onto a patient without wearing PPE and have that one-way drop-in engagement? So they save hundreds and thousands of dollars of money just on PPE in hospitals. And in senior care, it was just about the connection. And so once that started to happen, Alexa Smart Properties took that concept that we're using in hotels already and said, hey, we could do this, we can fleet manage, and by the way, we can also create a HIPAA eligible, anonymized experience where there's privacy and security that is actually one of our big focus with this solution. Thank you. It occurred to me while you were talking, Gina, that voice is just, voice as a concept of a user interface is such a mega trend. I mean, you're talking about it with respect to the simplicity of engagement, the appropriateness of, you know, the interface for an older adult. But I mean, I use it as my identity when I'm checking into my Vanguard accounts. Um, I think we heard earlier about someone was speaking about voice as a diagnostic tool, how you speak. I think there was a study recently out of University of Melbourne in Australia about using voice technology to detect Parkinson's disease. So it strikes me that voice as a user interface is really one of these mega trends that we want to keep our eyes on. Um, Pooja, you talked about the importance of technology in building your company and specifically what's distinctive about how you plan to lower cost. Could you talk uh, two things really? One is since you're creating a Medicare Advantage plan from scratch, um, how did you think about the social determinants, number one? And what did you include that you mentioned one already, Papa, but beyond that? Um, and the second is exactly, you know, maybe a couple of examples of how you're employing technology. Uh, is it through machine learning or artificial intelligence that's actually allowing you to lower the cost or to dedicate more money to the member? Yeah, so maybe I can touch on your second question first in the sense that 
We embrace a cloud-based platform that embraces robotic process automation, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. And so when you think about that within a health plan, what you typically think about is the 15 to 20 really siloed departments that exist within a health plan. And within each of those departments, then uh, you end up using maybe 10 to 20 different vendors to be able to do your day-to-day -day functions and operations. Uh, to a health plan, that becomes extremely um, expensive and it becomes a cost burden. Um, but also on top of that, and on top of the cost of just contracting with those vendors, you have the integrations that need to occur to be able to do something as simple and easy as pay a claim right the first time. Um, to any providers in this room, I can guarantee you that the amount of time and energy you spend chasing a claim and chasing a payment um, can be removed and you can use that time and energy towards strategic initiatives that drive more value to you and to your patients um, and to also your partners. And so by doing things like having really one end-to-end -end process and one platform that we embrace through the entirety of our organization, we're reducing the resource burden, we're reducing the amount of vendors that we contract with, um, and we're also able to allocate now a lot of our time and energy and dollars into things that will actually be able to drive value to not only our members, but also to all of our stakeholders and our partners. Um, also by embracing AI, robotic process automation and machine learning, we're actually able to automate about two to 3,000 functions that happen within a health plan. What, what are a couple examples of that? Yeah. Um, so something as easy as claims adjudication, right? Mm -hmm. I say easy because it's built into the platform, but um, you know, being able to have uh, guardrails put in place mm -hmm. to know when you're able to see a clean claim come through and you can process it. So now instead of saying, OK, I'm going to give myself 30 days to pay this out, I can get it paid in 15 days and move on to the next next item. Um, prior authorizations. Mm -hmm. Right. I think we've seen it in the, the news and we've seen a lot of kind of the mishaps that occur when uh, prior authorizations are not done and approved in a timely manner. Um, and, and the impact it has on our members' lives and the providers' patients' lives. And so being able to automate that process and building guardrails again, where you're saying, you know, for certain auths, you're doing an auto auth approval. Um, and that saves time again, not only on our side, but it also allows providers now to be a little bit more lean in terms of their staffing too, where they can now, the staff can allocate more time to, to actually seeing the patient when they're in the mm -hmm. waiting room and, and they engage with them a little bit further. Um, and so those are just two examples, yep. but when you kind of break it down, there's so many different touch points within a health plan to be able to kind of complete that member life cycle. And if we can even chip away slightly at those, we end up seeing a lot of cost savings. Um, and then what was your first the question? Social determinants. Um, for the what, social determinants. What I'm specifically curious about is how you thought about it as a new plan, what to include, maybe what not to include. Yeah, so we were the first new health plan to launch in Massachusetts since 2013. Um, and so that presented with its own set of unique challenges. But to me, uh, the opportunity outweighed the challenges in the sense that because there wasn't a new plan since 2013, there was so much room for innovation and for us to be able to do more from a product perspective. Um, I always say if you take a product that we built in Massachusetts and you drop it into like Texas, Arizona, California, even um, what I wanted was a product that would be just as viable in those markets, because if you took an existing product in the market and dropped it there, it wouldn't be able to survive because of the high cost of the premiums and just how each product kind of looked the same. So some of the things we did was we brought in completely new benefits that weren't seen in the market. So we brought in um, the companionship benefit because we believed that building a sense of community and tying people back to other people in the community was gonna be critical to building relationships, but also to building a support system and utilizing resources that already exist within the community. Um, in addition to that, we, we brought on um, a, a grocery benefit where people who are eligible actually get about $480 annually where they can spend towards healthy groceries. Um, and again, that's not a cure and solution, right? Because that's not gonna be enough to really sustain healthy groceries and healthy habits for the full year. But it's a starting point where when you're able to kind of get someone to see the benefits, and this is credit goes to my mother who's a primary care physician, but also tries to act like my dietitian. Yeah. Um, and she always says, you know, what you put in your body is how you feel. And mm -hmm. so 
once you start to feel the benefits of eating healthy, you're more likely to kind of incline to, to building those kinds of habits. Um, and so those were two new benefits, but then we also took existing benefits and kind of re-envisioned them. So for example, we took the transportation benefit and the market consistently, you get either 12 um, round trips or 24 one-way trips to the doctor. What we did was we realized that, especially in our service area, the area we were operating in, um, one of the biggest barriers to accessing care was transportation um, because parking is really challenging in the city. So people don't wanna drive and, and people in general don't wanna drive 30, 40 minutes to their appointments. So we're offering unlimited transportation to our members with no mile limit, with no um, you know, dollar amount that's associated to it. It's completely free of charge to them. And the idea behind that is we want to show our provider partners that we're truly a partner in this and we're actively committed to making sure that we can actually ensure that our members are getting the care and the services they need. Um, but two, to make sure that we're reducing any kind of financial burdens that might be in place that prevent people from getting access to care. Um, and and that's, that's really critical for us. Thank you. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, Gina, I'd also uh, like to talk with you a little bit about some specific examples. Um, since a lot of people in the room indicated that they have uh, an Alexa device, they probably are familiar with sort of um, trigger words, the, the hey, whatever, um, and also the notion of skills. Um, but maybe you could just say a word about that, sort of what is the ecosystem that, that you're developing, and then a couple of specific examples that um, have emerged as useful examples of using Alexa in the senior living facilities. Yeah, so I think, and it's hard because I actually, a little dirty secret, um, before I joined Alexa, I didn't actually have one. Um, <laughs> but, um, but I obviously not only believe in it, but I also see the value. And I think the big thing about it is, and again, to distinguish between consumer, that's the ones that you just buy off of our store or wherever, um, versus what you get in a senior living community or a hospital per se, or even a hotel, it's a little bit different because it's owned by that provider. So that's that's really important to know the difference. Um, but one of the things I don't think people understand is there's actually 100,000 skills in the Alexa skill store. So as a consumer, you can actually download any of those skills onto your Alexa device. For example, there's like Bible studies, there's like, um, you know, all these religious study content, Jeopardy, I mean, you name Lights. it, there's all kinds of things you can download. And I don't think everyone knows that. So take that one step further and go into where I am on the property side um, and the providers, they can also do the same thing. But the difference is, is they own that device. So they put content that they want on that device. So if all they want is just music and weather, and they want these five skills from whatever content that they're trying to manage. And by the way, they want to add a check-in skill that's ambient. And when I use the word ambient, meaning it's not obtrusive, like an older adult doesn't want you to just keep asking if you're alive, if you're okay. <laughs> kind of like, you know, but for some reason in senior housing, we like to ask that question. So um, <laughs> what uh, I think the Alexa Smart Property, some of our skills will actually ask simple questions like, Mr. Jones, would you like to go to dinner today? And that by engaging with the Alexa device, you can now know from a passive engagement if Mr. Jones is doing okay. Meaning that if they've talked to their Alexa 12 times, by the way, Amazon doesn't see that data, it's anonymized. The provider sees that data. So now they can use that data to support that older adult living in the community. Some of the skills we've been talking about, one of our partners, um, one of our solution providers that just built out um, Philips Lifeline. Lifeline has actually developed a skill around how do you take a nurse call system that sits where there's a button on the wall and then you have a pendant, but what if you don't wear your pendant? And what if you're not close to the button? Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? You can just ask Alexa for help. And now that help can go to wherever you want it to go, to the front desk, to the caregiver that's supporting that older adult, but interesting enough, to your point, our AI mechanism, and I don't think people really understand, there are so many ways that you can ask for help. So what, what we oftentimes do, do work with like a provider 
they'll list out all the things, hey, we want to ask A, B, C, D, and they can come up with 300 queries. And then our AI goes in and says, okay, but how many other ways can we ask the same thing? And it could blow up the 300 to thousands of different ways of asking. And we build that in the mechanism of asking for help. So no one would ever think that it's that complicated, but it's super important that we get this right. So that when that older adult might've just said, I've fallen Alexa, it should automatically indicate something, some path. And so our, our solution providers are getting really sophisticated to recognize what are other ways someone is asking for help. Mm -hmm. It's almost like pathways. Yeah for help <laughs> as we have care pathways we have health right. pathways correct right. i, I want to stick with you for a second gina and anticipate a question that maybe some people are thinking about you mentioned that the data is anonymized and that amazon doesn't have the data other than in an anonymized way what what about um i'm sure there are some people here or listening online who have concerns about privacy of data have concerns about amazon devices listening to conversations you know pick your question how, how do you respond to that um, yes, I know everyone is scared of big, big Amazon, big, bad Amazon is listening to you right now. Um, no, um, in Alexa Smart Properties, I can only speak about my solution is that we actually um, not only live and die by our security policy, the big thing about it is that um, we actually delete um, all recordings and data tw every 24 hours as part of this. And as I said, it is anonymized, so we don't actually have a name attached to any one of the devices um, inside of Alexa Smart Property. So in a senior living community, inside of a hotel, inside of a healthcare system, we don't have any of that. So that's super important, obviously, because I think people do think we are listening. Um, the only way that Alexa actually works, and actually all voice is a wake word. So if the wake word isn't actually engaged, um, then again, you can look at our policies online, but Alexa Smart Properties, that is something we wouldn't even have a conversation with a solution uh, actual provider if this wasn't part of what we do. Thanks. Um, Michelle, one of the things we talked a lot about was the service um, managers that you have in your properties and the various services that they mm -hmm. are able to provide. Yeah. I wonder if you could share with the group a little bit more about that notion, both of service managers, what they do mm -hmm. and where they're overwhelmed yeah, um, sure. and maybe how technology can help right. address some of that. Yeah. Well, um, if I can, I'll want to take yeah, one step sure. back because I didn't answer your second question, which was what, what was I saying when I said longevity is a privilege? Yes. Um, so I think, you know, most everybody I'm sure in this room knows that there's a tremendous gap in terms of how your life expectancy is depending on your zip code. Well, we see it every day. Um, in our affordable housing. So I was just looking at these. I love these. <laughs> Financial security is not what is typical for somebody in affordable housing. They've never had that in their most likely their life and especially in their elder years. Physically fit. Um, some of our residents have had some of the hardest jobs that you can imagine, right? Really hard jobs, truck drivers, delivery people have been on their feet their entire life. So we actually see the real big gap that we do consider longevity, it is a privilege in many ways. It's about how much resource you've had growing up. It's about how much resources you have to your aging journey. Um, so in affordable housing, we often see um, the folks that have the least of those options. Um, and one of the things that's really very challenging, I'll give you two. Number one is to be very honest, we have dumb buildings. Um, everything. I love <laughs> listening to Gina talk because I'm like, I want everything you've got. Um, and I can't put any of it in because we don't have what I have in my market rate housing. My residents who move in assume that they will have internet in their apartments. They assume it and they're paying a rent check in order to have that. There is nobody, almost nobody who moves into my affordable housing, my senior affordable housing, who assumes that they're going to have internet in their unit. And how, and how, what percentage of them actually are able to get it on their own? Um, on their own, we usually have about 40 to 45% of our residents who will um, get it on their own or their kids will underwrite a check for it. Um, and often it, they're paying more than they should for it or more than their income would allow. So that is a huge barrier. So we consider this longevity gap to be also a digital gap. Both of those we feel are ones that we really need to be approaching together. Um, 
So then, so what do we allow? What do, can we do for those who are not, not in all this place of more privilege or options? Um, we have in our buildings something called, we call a service coordinator. And service coordinators are really the people in our building that serve as kind of the adult child when they may not have one or their, their kids live pretty far away. Um, we have a lot of folks, we'd say about 20% of the folks who live with us have no support system right near them. So isolation is big, um, resources is, is a big gap, and oh my stars, we could, we could talk all day about COVID and how it impacted those who lived with us. Um, so the service coordinators really become an amazing non-technology way of creating connections between our residents and the community at large. Um, and it's again, one of those, so we talk about what the managed care plans, the first thing they, they love affordable housing because mm -hmm. it means our residents are in a good, safe and affordable place. They love our service coordinators because our service coordinators become the eyes and the ears of our residents. Unfortunately, it's a very, very low tech, high touch model. And I believe that there's a real opportunity for us to revolutionize service coordination as a model in the very near future as we connect more and more of our residents and get them technology. Thank you for that, Michelle. Very, very interesting. Um, I want to turn it out to uh, the audience here or anybody online have a question. Anybody want to ask? Yes, right here. Uh, I think a microphone may be coming your way in just one second. Here we go. Should I go first? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm I'm an architect and also lead a nonprofit called At Home with Growing Older. And the fact is, you're totally right. There will never be enough affordable and especially senior housing. Most people age in their own homes, and most of our homes are imperfect. So and often very little changes actually make a big difference. You know, somebody somebody putting a safety strip on the nosing of the stair, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, I, I still think that's the missing piece of the puzzle here. And I'm wondering if there will come a time when health insurance, healthcare providers will actually help make this part of their health plan and see this as sort of the capped you know, fees they're going to pay yeah. that, you know, the home is actually part of the yeah. health environment so and the point of care. Yeah. That's part of the plan. Yeah, yeah. and very, very yeah. simple often, they do. you know. They do. Um, yeah, we actually do. And one of the nice things is, especially because we're federally regulated, right, with CMS, like they, they kind of dictate what kind of benefits we can and cannot offer. Um, they're starting to open it up. So we can pay for utilities. Mm -hmm. uh, we can start paying for railings in the home to make the home safer for an individual after right. an assessment. Um, so yeah, so there's a lot that, a lot that we can mm -hmm. do. And um, you're completely right. People do age in their own home and we want them to be able to be comfortable um, and kind of age where, where they feel comfortable and also to find ways to bring technology into the home in a really tangible, digestible manner where it's not just you're throwing a tablet or you're throwing high tech, right. high touch technology, but you're bridging the gap between the population of 10,000 people who are aging into Medicare every day, as well as the people who really like those kind of traditional approaches of picking up the phone and physically talking and, and interacting with somebody. So. Mm -hmm. As we get closer, I think we're starting to bridge the gap. And even from a benefits perspective, we're starting to see that there's a lot more we can do and we should do. Um, and I think you'll start to see that more and more from other plans as well. Right. I think we have another question right here. Yes, thanks. Um, Bob Kramer with Nexus Insights and NIC. I have a question in terms of, uh, I love the discussion about the needs and the opportunity in affordable housing. But my question for the panelists, maybe starting with you, Pooja, with starting a new MA plan, and that is, how can we reach a population most people are ignoring now? Mm -hmm. And that's basically what we've labeled it, and I see the forgotten middle. Mm -hmm. There are those that have too much in resources to qualify for the supports, mm -hmm. uh, Michelle, that you've talked about, housing support, long-term services support, so forth, but not enough to afford the private pay options out there today, at least for very long. Mm -hmm. And we know in our studies that this is going to be the single largest socioeconomic cohort mm -hmm. of adults age 75 plus in the future. Mm 
Mm -hmm. but it's just getting very little attention. And particularly I'm interested here, given your discussion as a panel on what I call the lower half of that forgotten middle. People that otherwise are going to not be getting the preventive health care they should be getting, not even taking the medications, making choices about food, medicine, doctor visits, usually bad choices, but driven by fear of running out of money. Mm -hmm. And so particularly, what, how might we think creatively about a program to reach that cohort? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, the first kind of step is, I think that's the beauty of Medicare Advantage prescription drug organizations, because we are not serving the dual population where it's the Medicaid, Medicare population, which is that low income population that would meet the mm -hmm. affordable housing requirements. But we're offering a product for, you know, kind of your, your middle mass and, and especially even that lower middle mass. And um, the idea behind it is that we're able to kind of assess the market, see what's out there and see also what community resources are out there too, right? I think one of the biggest things is uh, we have to stop reinventing the wheel when we don't need to. And we have to tap into community resources and things that are already present and find ways to tie back to the community when possible. And then when not possible, and when, when we do need to innovate and step outside of the box, that's where we spend the resources and the dollars towards pushing that in. So one example I can give you is as a health plan, Within our organization, we have care managers and care coordinators. The role of those individuals is to start to segment the population, identify your moderate and high risk population, and then take a look at the benefits we offer and say, okay, you are someone who falls into this kind of category or your moderate risk, and maybe you have a chronic condition that could then take you into being high risk. But we have XYZ benefits that you can tap into that are free of charge to you, free of cost to you, that can actually help kind of drive you on a different path. And then you build a care plan, you stay on top of that member, you build a relationship with them, and, and that's how you solve for that. I think one other point I'll make too is with the Medicare population in general, uh, when you think about inflation or a recession and you think about the populations that get hit the hardest, it's your low income population as well as your senior population because they're on fixed incomes no matter what. And so that's why I think it's so important for me as an organization to make sure that I'm doing as much as I possibly can to reduce our costs internally so that all of those dollars and extra savings I'm seeing, I'm pushing back into our products so we can build really rich products. Yeah. Um, if I can, I'll just yeah. add. Um, so I think th it's the problem that is before all of us, right? I mean, we talk about longevity. Well, longevity is also demographic shift. And if you think about every sector where we have this problem, whether it's in the, the lower income folks where we have 10 people for every unit that there is, or if it's the middle sector where it's an incredibly growing sector, it doesn't matter. All of those, we, what we know is there is a journey of aging that is coming on that we all will experience, but we're going to have twice as many people experiencing it at the same time as we do today. And so I think one of the things that that does for all of us is it's the demographic reality. We know that the other side of that is if we rely only on people, there will not be enough people, no matter which of those groups, which sector we're talking about. There is not enough people to help those who want to go through that aging process with dignity, autonomy, and respect. So we need to continue, all of us, to work together on these solutions that allow us to augment people with technology in a way that helps each of those sectors. I mean, I, I think it's the most exciting time to be in this, in this industry. Um, but in order for us to do that, we have to really make sure we're coordinated. The healthcare system, the delivery system, the healthcare, the primary docs, the hospital systems, the Medicare Advantage plans, the uh, affordable housing providers, technology. If we are not all working together, it's going to be a hot mess. And so, but it's also a great opportunity. Very well said, Michelle. We have about a minute left, so you each get 20 seconds. Um, for all the entrepreneurs and innovators who are either in this room or listening online, what, what guiding principles do you have uh, for thinking about serving older adults with new products and services to extend their health spans? And um, Gina, I'm going to start with you. 20 seconds. <laughs> Go. <laughs> it's working. Um, wow. 
I, she gave me this question in advance, and of course, I, I kind of like. Uh, I don't even remember this I question don't remember. in advance. Um, <laughs> okay, well, we can we can skip to me. the show. Oh no no no, no 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 no! You start. You start. <laughs> I, I think the guiding principle is that technology is an enabler mm -hmm. and it is is there to solve a problem, it is not to replace people. It never is, it never will be. And I think if you keep thinking about what problem are you solving with this technology, you're on the right path. Yeah. And I will add that um, that don't forget about the fact that we have folks that aren't even accessible to that technology yet. We are on step one, which is getting folks connected so that they can get access to technology. And we are right now in the middle of a very interesting time when our government has put about a lot of in effort and funds to try to help break that digital divide. Yeah, I, I would have to say the same thing. I, I think that as a plan, as someone who's actively trying to see a change, we can't force change. So the biggest thing is being able to receive feedback and really receive direct feedback from the consumers to see what's working, what's not, because something I dream up in my head could not really pan out the way I want it to be uh, to the populations that's actually using it. Thank you so much to all of you for this remarkable discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you.